Hey everybody, this is John for MTG Nexus with another deck overview for the modern format. This time we're doing Mono Black Cabal Coffers. If you like these kind of deck overviews, please consider subscribing to the channel, giving us a thumbs up, and letting us know what deck you might like to see us cover next. So Cabal Coffers is a deck that has gone through many iterations over the time since it's begun to be iterating on, but most of the versions start with the card Cabal Coffers, which is two and tap, add black for each swamp you control. And then the card Orborg Tomb of Yogmoth. Each land is a swamp in addition to its other land types. This effectively turns into the deck into a mono black Karn deck, mono black Tron deck, that is enabled to cast a very powerful ending game spells, kind of akin to Tron, but only with your black threats. That said, it does share another thing in common with Tron. It has cards to find your various different pieces like Expedition Map and Profane Tutor, both of which will allow you to find your namesake cards. Also a lot like Mono Green Karn, it is largely centered around the card Karn the Great Creator and the wish board that that gives you access to, basically giving you a Swiss Army Knife to answer almost everything problematic this deck can find. Beyond that, the deck in the early game is a very much a mid-range mono black deck using things like Thoughtseize, Inquisition to keep your opponent off balance and disrupting their strategy while you set up your own. And using things like Fatal Push and Blood, Th Blood Chief's Thirst to kill their early threats to keep you in the game. Uh, beyond that, you have a bunch of other Planeswalkers like Liliana of the Veil to help keep your opponent honest. And a little bit of sweepers with things like Damnation to keep creature decks under control while you're getting your mana engine set up. There are different things the decks run. Um, there used to be a reanimator version that would feature uh, Persist, Unmarked Grave, and a bunch of Archons of Cruelty. Those ones have kind of subsided, as most of the lists that I've been able to find have mostly been based around Karn the Great Creator and the Wish Board that that represents. Another card that is becoming more and more in vogue is Invoke Despair, the very powerful uh, five mana sorcery with Quad Black. Target opponent sacrifices a creature. If they can't, you draw a card. If an enchantment for a planeswalker. So this is kind of a card advantage spell one way or another. You either force your opponent to a sack a bunch of permanents or they're losing and losing life or you're drawing cards, both of which are quite nice for this deck. Uh, beyond that, you do get to play a bunch of value lands in your deck. You get to play things like Takanuma as a way to recur your very few threats, which is one problem the deck has we'll talk about in a minute. And then things like Blast Zone as a backdoor way to answer a lot of annoying things out of your opponent's deck. You also get to run multiple copies of Castle Lockdwain, um, as this is a way to draw cards as you're, you know, playing out your hand and, you know, maybe running low on resources in the mid-game. Uh, beyond that, you do run a couple of fetch lands uh, for different various reasons, both to thin your deck. Um, some versions also have played Citadel Bolas in the past and also as a way to turn on if you're playing something like Emrakul the Promised End, reducing the cost of that. And in addition, it just helps to cycle uh, thin out your deck that just that tiny extra a little bit. You do play obviously a bunch of basic swamps because you do need to turn on your Cabal Coffers sometimes the hard way um, if you can't get a copy of Urborg and Cabal Coffers and play at the same time. Say your opponent's playing things like Field of Ruin or you have a Blood Moon. That kind of stuff is just nice to have access to plain old swamps to cast your spells. Uh, beyond that, like I said, you do get to run a number of high value powerful things, most notably Archon of Cruelty in this version. Other versions run different things that we'll talk about in a minute. Another card that's very powerful in this to help keep you alive is Mark, March of Wretched Sorrow. This is, is very similar to the uh, much of other, uh, the various other pitch spells that you've seen. Um, as additional cost, you may exile any number of black cards to cost two less. And then March of Wretched Sorrow deals X damage target creature or planeswalker and you gain X life. This is an additional way to deal with creatures and planeswalkers. Sometimes you have to extra copies of cards in your hand, like say a second copy of Liliana, or Invoke Despair you can't cast, this allows you to pump things up, deal with opponents early run in sixes and stuff potentially, say they've ticked down to kill something or deal some damage, like say they've killed, ticked down to kill Torak, you can ping off their run in six, etc. Or just ways to deal with annoying things like potentially Teferi Hero, not Teferi Hero Dominary, Teferi Time Raveler, keeping your Suspend uh, Profane Tutor from coming off. Beyond that, we've already kind of talked about, this is a very much a Karn bullet deck. Um, the bullets will vary from thing to thing. Um, this version is running Tormod's Crypt and Relic of Progenitus for Graveyard Hate against decks like 
Merktide, Dredge, Reanimator, etc. Pithing Needle shuts down annoying things, especially something like Renin Six if they have a Seiju rolling. Uh, Stone Brain, nice thing to nice surgical extraction X effect to deal with whatever your opponent's got going on. Um, say they're Primeval Titan deck or they're a um, Rhino's deck can kind of extract their main thing. Liquid Metal Coating, kind of a mainstay in the Karn Wish boards, especially in the modern format. Something that fortunately Pioneer is missing out on. Um, this allows you to blow up your opponent's lands. Uh, wish Claw Talisman is an interesting addition. It allows you to kind of wish for anything in your deck with a downside of giving it to your opponent. But since you're a Karn deck, your opponent doesn't get to access the Wish Claw Talisman when it goes to them. Staring Bridge to keep aggressive decks from killing you. Um, keeps things like Death Shadows and Murktides from attacking you, even if you have a moderate-sized hand. Worm Coil Engine, primarily there for the mid-range and aggressive decks. Gains you a little bit of life, tough to kill creature. Thund Sundering Titan, very good against those 4 and 5 color leyline binding mana bases. Walking Ballista, pretty good against a lot of creatures and can be a single, single win con on its own with the absurd amount of mana this deck can output with Cabal Coffers. And then Chalice the Void, this is mostly here to blank the Cascade decks, but can also come in against decks with a myriad of one drops, such as Hammer Time and Burn, potentially. This version is opting for much the same thing, although we are seeing different things. You are seeing a Field of Ruin here to disrupt your opponent's mana base and allow you to fetch up Swamps on your own. This is a nice way to counteract problematic lands, such as Tron lands against Amulet Titan, etc., um, also seeing Mystifying Maze, which is kind of a fixed version of uh, Maze of Ith. Um, exile target attacking creature when opponent controls. The beginning of the next end step returns to the battlefield tapped under your opponent's control. Obviously this can be problematic if it's an ETB creature, but this can buy you time in a lot of situations against maybe your opponent's uh, Murktad regen or something. Maybe you're having a hard time answering. And then, you know, beyond that, still running a lot of the same things. Uh, this version is also running Relic of Progenitus in the main deck um, as a way to deal with uh, graveyard base decks, and also it's a cantrip in the worst situations. Defile is an interesting one. Target creature gets minus one, minus one, to one to turn for each swamp you control. Obviously, it scales throughout the game. Maybe not quite as good as something like Fatal Push, but in the late game can kill something much bigger than Fatal Push is capable of doing. The rest of the cards we weren't going to talk about, although the one of Torak is interesting. This is quite a nice card against the mid-range and control decks, allowing you to get cards out of their hand, even against something like Burn, maybe on turn four, kicking this, forcing them to discard their last two cards in hand, maybe buying you that little bit of time you need to set, set up shop with your combo. Uh, sideboard options, a lot of the same things, but the aforementioned Bullis' Citadel. This is a very much a card advantage engine, especially in the grindy mid-range and control matchups. Um, you can look at the top card of your library at any time. You may plan, may play lands and cast spells from the top of your library with paying its mana cost rather than its van, mana value. And then you do have the tap, sacrifice 10 non-land permanents. Each opponent loses 10 life. Unlikely to hit that in this deck, but it is something to note. Uh, one card I think I forgot to cover in the other version, Dothy Voidwalker, is a multi-purpose all-star. Um, this can come in against graveyard decks and come in against... Decks that may be boarding out some of their removal to pressure them in the early turns. Um, also potentially combos with something like Inquisition and Thoughtseize. Take something powerful out of your opponent's hand and be able to play it yourself. So this can be a backdoor way to win the game in some situations. And just otherwise is decent graveyard hate and early pressure in the control in mid-range mirror matches. Another interesting card, Oblivion Stone as a way to answer uh, your opponent's entire board. Um, obviously, it's a little bit slow, but is a nice way to reset the board and as another board sweeper you have access to with the card wish board. The rest of the cards we've already kind of covered in the previous version. This version, just a tiny bit different than what it's trying to execute, but a lot of the same stuff. Uh, this deck has main deck cling to dust, which is a way to both uh, attack your opponent's graveyard a little bit, potentially keep them from reanimating something, or uh, taking a key card away before they can uh, flash it back with something. Something like Memory Deluge or something out of blue-white control. Um, but also a good way to draw cards in kind of those situations and gain you a tiny little bit of life. Some of the aggressive matchups such as Burn or maybe potentially Hammer Time buy you a little bit of time. Uh, Maze Mind Tone is an interesting addition. This kind of is a fill in the gap card that this deck otherwise is missing a tiny bit. Um, the deck does have a, the jump from one to three that really isn't a whole lot going on. This allows you to turn that into either Scries or Card Draw with a little bit of life tacked on. Uh, so it fills multiple purpose roles, gains you a little bit of life in the mid-game, um, allows you to draw cards much like something like uh, Reckoner Bankbuster does in the uh, 
Mid-range decks and some of the Pioneer decks, and is a very interesting card overall. Dismember, removal spell, um, this has the advantage of getting around, um, you know, indestructible effects by giving something minus X, minus X, and you can always cast it on one by paying a little bit of life for the Phyrexian mana costs. Uh, the interesting one in this one is Golos Tireless Pilgrim, which allows you to have additional ways to fetch up your bullet lands, in addition to, obviously, your Cabal Coffers and Orborg, and has an activated ability that we'll talk about in a second. Walking Ballista in the main deck gives you that much more interaction in the early turns, while also being a great mana sink in the late team, without having necessarily absurd mana costs attached to it with something like Archon of Cruelty. Um, the options in this one are a little bit different. Academy Ruins is interesting. Um, this version is running one of Island, this allows you to kind of recycle your various artifacts. Um, obviously, Bajuka Bog is a way to attack your opponent's graveyard. Uh, nuke their at one time graveyard nuke. Demolition Field. Destroy target non basic land and opponent controls that land's controller. May search the library for basic land, put it on the battlefield. You may search the library for basic land. Then, okay. So, basically, another field of ruin effect. So, this deck is going hard on the blowing up your opponent's lands plan, apparently. Um, and obviously, you have access to Urborg and the one of basic island. Um, a lot of these decks often run Cascading Cataracts as a way to activate Golos, but this version seems to be going heavy on the land destruction plan with the Demo Demolition Field and Field of Ruin. Sideboard, you're seeing the Inquisitions in the sideboard as opposed to the main deck. Um, still seeing a lot of the same options, you know, a new one in this one is Mind Slaver, which is basically a 10 mana, gain control of your opponent's turn. Obviously this can be split up over you know, both casting cost and activation cost, but 10 mana, take your opponent, control of your opponent's turn. Yeah, you know, something like Ember Call the Promise in without the big body attached to it. And then the rest of the cards we've already kind of talked about, Engineering Explosives, not the best in a deck that only produces one or two colors of mana, but, you know, it can be here to answer Rhinos, Urza Saga tokens, uh, Colossal Hammers, etc. And taking a look at this one, this one's kind of an amalgamation of all the different things we've talked about. Obviously, you have the Inquisition and Thoughtseize plan, the Expedition map, the Fatal Pushes, the Damnations, but basically this deck goes from 1 to 4 or 5 and above. Um, you know, you're running a couple copies of Archon of Cruelty. I think overall this is one of the more balanced versions of the deck. Um, obviously still running Castle Lockdown and such, but not necessarily the, the LD plan of some of the other versions. Sideboard options, a lot of the same stuff. Um, you're running Nihil Spell Bomb as an additional graveyard hate piece in addition to things like Relic of Progenitus or Tormod's Crypt. Um, Necromentia is a way to potentially, once again, when it's like the Stone Brain, get rid of your opponent's key cards. Um, and then the rest of the cards we've already kind of talked about. Now, obviously, this deck is not a top tier modern deck, but it is something that does pop up every now and again. I know content creators from Aspiring Spike and I believe even Doomwake have worked on this list, as well as uh, Fluffy Wolf has worked on it. Um, it's basically a very cute deck that has a notable problem. Um, you're kind of this hybrid between like Green Tron and like Jun mid range. You have this game plan where you're disrupting your opponent early, and then if you're if you don't assemble your land part of your combo, you're stuck with these clunky four, five, eight, eight drops in your deck and really have problems functioning. So you're very very dependent upon your profane tutors and your expedition maps and your goalless is finding obviously either your cabal coffers or your Urborg, just as a way to kind of get ahead on mana. Um, the other problem is, you're obviously vulnerable to land hate. You know, things like Alpine Moon, things like um, Blood Moon, etc. All of which attack, you know, what you're doing. Now obviously, you're not as vulnerable to Blood Moon in terms of being able to cast your spells, because you do have a bunch of swamps, a bunch of fetch lands, um, you know, Profane Tutors, Expedition Maps, different ways to find swamps, etc. So, you're not going to get locked out of the game by Blood Moon, but much like Tron, you're going to get significantly slowed down if you do. Um, the other problem is, the deck has a lot of air. Um, if you look at a lot of these versions, uh, you know, even if you look at, say, Karn, Golos, Archon of Cruelty, and, say, Invoke Despair, all those bombs, you're only running between 8 to 10 bombs in the deck. So, you do have a lot of air in your deck. That's why you're seeing some of these, you know, different versions running, like, uh... You know, Maze Mind Home is kind of a bridge. I really think if I were to build a deck, I would probably build it like something like this, but maybe not be as heavy on the LD plan. Um, you know, 
I really don't have a lot of experience personally with the deck. I just have seen a lot of the deck being played. And it does have that kind of like tweener problem. So in order to beat it, get under the deck, disrupt its mana. Or even with something like Necromentia, you can potentially say Necromentia, a card in the Great Creator. All of a sudden they're down to like three or four frets that they can find. Um, that, you know, it's not the most, it is a very powerful go over the top deck and have a reasonable matchup against, you know, the Omneth piles, the, uh, Indomitable Creativity decks, if you can keep them off creativity, etc. You know, you have these very, this very powerful go over the top plan, but you are, you're infinitely disruptible. You only have a few cards that really matter. And sometimes you can even struggle beating, destroying some large creatures like Murktide region, because a lot of your removal is cost-based. For instance, Fatal Push, uh, Blood Chief's Thirst, you have to kick it in order to kill. And then obviously those decks prey on things with things like Spell Pierce, Counter Spells, etc. Um, so, you know, the deck is very interesting to play. Uh, once it gets its engine online, it's almost unbeatable. So you either have to kind of beat it early or disrupt it and beat it. Obviously there are plenty of decks that do that in the format. That said, you know, it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lot of the other mid-range decks in the format. Um, has enough bullets for... You know, certain matchups, like you could probably have game against Living End because you have, you know, Karn plus bullets. Um, say you thought seize their first Cascade spell, buy yourself time, cast Karn, find your Graveyard Hate piece, kind of set yourself up that way. This is very much a deck that, you know, it's Tron-esque with a few extra steps. Um, has a little bit more interaction, so it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like Blue Tron and it's this weird amalgamation of a couple of different archetypes and then somehow forms this cohesive game plan that wins a lot of games but that's it you know it's a deck you should be aware of in the format it's a, probably a very fun deck to play at least the times i've seen it played it looks like a, a blast to play but you do have to be aware sometimes you're gonna have the wrong half of the deck problem or sometimes your opponent's gonna have the right disruption and your opponent's all gonna go fall apart and you're just gonna be like why am i playing this pile so as always, this has been John for MTG Nexus. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hope to see you for the next video.